do to be able to do the things that they're doing. So in the Food Not Bombs example, we recognize that with, with, we were in Cambridge, Massachusetts in the early 80s. There were over 100 anti-war groups. There were like 75 solidarity groups of various Central American clubs in the metro Boston area. Literally hundreds of progressive groups. And every single one of them was small and was not growing. You know, they had a stable band of people around them. And they had a manifesto. They had the right answers, okay? And they made you agree to their manifesto in order to belong to the group. And that's why they didn't have many members, because their manifesto was very narrow and deeply defined. And we were food not bombs. We, were, we identified as anarchists. We had been reading Emma Goldman and Kropotkin and, and, and Karl Marx. And we, we'd been reading, studying. And we said, well, we don't want to tell anybody what to think. That's sort of the kind of opposite of anarchy, right? I mean, we actually want people to think for themselves. So we don't want to write a manifesto, but we do want people to join what we're doing. So what we said was rather than have a manifesto, we will have an activity. We will have something that they can do. And if they do that activity, they will learn the politics we believe is true. They will learn it themselves because they will have the experience of it. And so what we said was, is there's so much food being wasted right now in our society, it's still true to this day. And so if you are creative, if you have a theatrical bent, if you know how to manipulate things, systems, you can collect a huge amount of food for free right here, right now, every day, in any city in the United States. It's being wasted, but it's perfectly edible. You can collect it, and you can give it away to people as an environmental issue, not as charity. It's saying, please eat this. If you eat this, you're helping me, because otherwise I have to throw it away. And I got this because I didn't want it to be thrown away. Totally fundamentally puts the whole dynamic of charity and poverty up on its head. Because this society is so wealthy, and we kind of know that, it really is obscene that we have anybody going hungry because we're throwing away more food than there are mouths to eat it. In fact, right now, today, that's been true for 30 years. There are now people being away. But I, I try to get tra mainstream politicians to get this fact that they don't want any partner because having hungry people is good for capitalism. So they're never going to end hunger in this country. It's a perpetual machine to keep hunger in place. So it's going to be done. It's going to be done by the people, and it's going to be radical politics because they hate food not bombs. They don't know how to stop it because it's no centralized anything. Now this was designed to be an activity around three core values and collect food and give it away. One value is nonviolence or anti-militarism and codified in the name food not bombs. It's clear it's anti-militarist which means nonviolence in my world. Vegetarianism which is actually a subset of nonviolence but that's because it's a better kind of food to distribute and it's better for the planet. It's safer to do on the street and consensus decision making, which has been interpreted by the kids that do food up bombs as no leaders. Collective decision making. And they stumble through it and do the best they can, but they understand that the goal is that everybody in the collective has a voice. They kind of have the spirit of group group. They understand that they're, what they're striving for is not that. Now, of course, informal, uh, un you know, non-official, uh, charismatic types take over and dominate, and that happens, of course. But the culture of food up bombs throughout the world is to be leaderless and to allow unusual or non-empowered people to step up and take a role. But you can do it with five people. That's all it takes and it takes no money. So you don't have to fundraise, you don't have to have money, you can just use your bicycle, you can use your feet, you can collect food that you can find by being smart and creative and giving it away. So that's spread literally throughout the world. I mean, most people don't realize that there are major networks of food not bombs in Europe. That's been going on for decades. I, the, 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 the Germans have more national gatherings than the United States have had of food not bombs gatherings. Um, it was very big during the Bosnian-Serbian War, and Croatia and Bosnia have big food not bombs networks because they actually really helped in a time of crisis. The chapter of food not bombs in, in um, Kuala Lumpur, which is the capital of Malaysia, in 2007 got a national award as a humanitarian group which bums me out because Food Not Bombs is not a humanitarian group, but in Indonesia, in Malaysia, that's the way they present it. And they're big, they're very successful. And I saw a videotape of this young man, he was in his mid-20s, late 20s, and they speak English there, I guess, because of the former colony of England or something. And he's standing in Kuala Lumpur, the table, it looks just like that table, you know, the food table over there. I mean, the Food Not Bombs, it's a central picture. And he picks up my book, the Food Not Bombs book, and says, this book changed my life. But that it was designed to be an affinity group, decentralized, no hierarchy, no centralized organization, because then it couldn't be stopped. It's a hydra. You stomp on one food up bombs and five more pop up. 
That was the whole design of it. It worked beautifully. It's still going on. It's bigger in most other parts of the world than it is in the United States. And it's pretty big in the United States. And in the United States, food and bomb traps have, have shaped and changed local and state laws to make it so that this public space is safe for places, for movements like this, and the food to be shared without, uh, it's given away for free, without harassment by the police because they're not selling it, which they don't recognize as legal. But we've carved that space out, and we're still work fighting, and still uh, wishing that some, uh, uh, like the ACLU would take our case, because it's so funny, three or four years ago when, when I was here in New York trying to get them to take our case, they were saying that it wasn't a, a systemic. And I said, how many cities do we have to be attacked in before it becomes systemic. Because at that point, we were simultaneously being attacked in five different cities in the United States. This is two or three years ago. And that was maybe double the number of total attacks in history. And so it's escalating as well. And they didn't see it. But it's very low level. It's very non-threatening. You don't, nothing much happens to activists when they get arrested for doing food up bombs. Back in, um, I can tell you the exact day, the day that O.J. Simpson did his famous car chase thing with all the TV channels, right, that? That day was supposed to be a huge day in Food Not Bombs history because, I mean, it's amazing to me. Greenpeace in LA, their national office, I think that's where their national office is, but their, but their office in LA was hosting a press conference for Food Not Bombs where Food Not Bombs was going to announce that for the first time ever, Amnesty International, this very reputable and very cool organization, was going to declare Food Not Bombs activists prisoners of conscience in advance of arrest. And the reason why they did that was because they observed what was happening in the United States in particular. And what the police were doing around the country was attacking food nut bombs, arresting them on the square, taking them to the police station, releasing them. And doing that all over. Therefore, there's no court, there's no charges, there's no way to fight back, we couldn't stop them. So they, that all they could do to help us was say, well, if anybody does go to jail, well, well you're automatically one of our campaigns. And we never got to have that press conference. I think that's huge, actually. But that's what's going on. So, okay. So the third movement, I said, oh, I'm doing great. Okay, so the third movement, I hope this is making sense to it. See, there's kind of logic to it. So the third movement is the Pledge of Resistance. Now, the original Pledge of Resistance came out of the faith communities. Uh, religious people from various denominations saw this war brewing in Central America. And you know, it's not like the first time the United States invaded Central America. This does happen, right? So it looked like it was gonna happen again. This is 1984, I believe, 83. And so the first pledge was the pledge of resistance to prevent a war on an invasion of, of El Salvador. Because that's where it looked like it was, because El Salvador was already sinking into civil war. There were armed communist guerrillas, you know, patriots, up in the mountains fighting back as the buildings were decimated. And, um, the, the U.S. military funding the heavily, heavily funding the, the security police who were doing horrible atrocities. And it was getting out of control. So the idea was is that if the U.S. would authorize ground troops, the day that they authorize it, this movement, the pledge would be activated and everybody would sign the pledge and pledge to occupy, again, it was occupied, their congressperson's office and refuse to leave until the troops were home. And just go back and go back and go back and just make it so they couldn't run the federal government if we had enough people. And that was the goal. We were going to, we were going to go to their offices, any of their offices, everywhere, and occupy their offices until the truth. That was the pledge. And the thousands, I think at the peak, something like 10,000 people nationally signed the pledge. It was a real threat. So much so that they never invaded. Now, they did something else that was equally as much, maybe worse, with hiring mercenaries to go in and do even more horrible atrocities, which actually happened. But we also protested that and made it really hot for them and also brought out the truth that, in fact, Oliver North, and I just had it confirmed the other day from a special agent, a special forces soldier who said, yeah, he talked about, he, he knows, you know, this actually happened where they were they were selling weapons to the Khomeini, who was in Iran, getting big bucks from that, taking it to Colombia, buying cocaine with it, bringing the cocaine back to the inner cities of the United States, selling it both to the African-American and Hispanic kids, and destroyed on crack, and taking that profit and buying the weapons and guns to fund the military operation in Central America. And that really happened out of the White House. And we were on it at that point. So in Boston, one of the largest pledge groups, we had something like 1,500, 2,000 signers. We had all, what we did, it was fairly simple in fact, we had events 
where the whole goal of the event was to form affinity groups. Like today, this could be a day where you're forming affinity groups. There could be nonviolence training, orientations, bringing people in and saying, this is what we're doing. And when a group of people came to an orientation or a training, that group of people became an affinity group. Right then and there, if they wanted to. Or that they already came through. But once you were, went through the training and the orientation, then you were offered to sign the pledge. Once you signed the pledge, then you were definitely in an affinity group. You, we'd help you get into an affinity group. And then once a month, each affinity group sent a spokesperson to the monthly spokes council, where we made all of our decisions by a really excellent consensus process with really skilled facilitators. And I have to admit that I was one of them, so I'm talking about myself. But there was a whole group of us, including some of you know Lisa Fithia. Who was, during, who was there then, in my affinity group actually, um, doing this. And there were other people as well, really skilled. Peter Woodrow from the Movement for a New Society, really skilled facilitators. Um, and, and people like Starhawk and, and uh, David Solnit out on the West Coast doing the same thing. We all knew each other at this point. And we were doing this really high level consensus work. So we had our spokes councils, which were well managed. The, the voices of the, of the affinity groups was heard because we you know, had that process. And each week, a group of about 15 or 20 coordinators, volunteer coordinators from the various affinity groups, would be to implement the decisions of the Spokes Council. Very important. Spokes Council made the decisions, and then the implementation fell to this volunteer coordinating group, and they would organize the affinity groups, and, then, and the people who do it, the actual work, would be the affinity groups. And sometimes they would specialize. They'd always want to do the graffiti, or always want to do the, you know, buying the gas mask go down to New York City to get the stuff. I mean, there were certain things that specialized in whatever it was we needed for our actions. So if the coordinating group had to do a certain thing, we'd turn to certain affinity groups that had been identified. And then there were other affinity groups just sort of like, you know, we're just volunteers. We'll just show up whenever you need us. We even did things like back in the, in the Clamshell days, but also during the, the, um, the Pledge of Resistance days, we would actually organize role plays, large scale role plays, where like several hundred people from Boston, we would find an abandoned warehouse or or whatever, and we would go through the role play of what we were planning to do as our scenario. And so, I, I should tell the story. This is how powerful, how beautiful it was. And of course, this is where I learned consensus. This is the crucible where I learned consensus, where I wrote my books in 87. So after this happened, the, the next thing that happened for me was I started teaching consensus. But this literally happened. The call in Boston, now that they didn't invade, kept changing it to try to deal with the changes they did. So by 85, it was, if they fund the Contra, if they give U.S. tax dollars to pay these mercenaries, we will call the pledge. We'll go out, okay? And so they did. I think in May of 85, maybe in 86. So we had this huge action. So we knew it was coming. We had a spokes council conveniently like the weekend before, because they were going to go into session. We knew they were going to vote. And so we were all prepared. It had to happen on a Wednesday conveniently, so right in the middle of the week. And at the spokes council on Sunday before, there's at least 125 people in the room, representing close to 2,000 people, in fact. And I'm facilitating, along with Lisa, possibly. And um, we're testing for consensus on our action, our plan, which was to um, blockade the doors of the JFK federal building, to shut the building down, to shut the federal government completely down by blockading the doors. And we had planned this all out, we role-played it, we were fully prepared. We knew the police were going to be brutal. We had lots of people willing to do it. It's going to be this big, dramatic event, but probably pretty violent. And at the very last minute, you know, we're testing for consensus. Somebody, a woman in the back, middle class, middle aged woman, probably white, I don't quite remember, says, I just can't go along with this. This is not, I mean, my friend works in that building, in the labor department. And I've been talking to her about the countries and about what's going on. And she doesn't quite believe me, but she's beginning to lean towards us. If she shows up to work that day and she sees all these actors blocking her way to work, she won't talk to me again. It'll be over. I've lost her. It doesn't seem like an action that we do should cause that. That seems backward to me. And everybody's, no, sit down, sit down. We've got to, you know, we've got to have this. We're like, quiet, quiet, everybody quiet. Let's hear, let her speak, let her speak. She finishes her statement and everybody's like, no, no, we have to decide now. So we hearing the genuineness of her voice, that she was genuinely concerned. She wasn't, you know, making something up. She was genuinely concerned. She was trying to help, which was our standard, right? She was being on the game. She wanted to do this thing. She just saw a flaw. So we, and we said, let's just take, this is important to us. Let's take 20 minutes, break up into affinity groups. Everybody break up into small groups, talk for 20 minutes about what could possibly be different about this action where we wouldn't have that outcome, but still do our action. And in 20 minutes, 
we came back with a proposal that instead of blocking the doors, we would occupy the lobby all day long. We'd start at 10 o'clock in the morning. This is a, a federal building with a three-story three atrium that could hold a thousand people. You know, like, like you, know, you guys are familiar with that. This is Boston. It's a federal building. And so we said, we'll, occupy, we'll, we'll create a town hall, a town meeting with as many people as we can. And that way, everybody who goes to that building will learn our message. And at the end of the day, we won't leave. It's our building. It's our action. We're going to stay there. And so we did that. It was a tremendously successful action, far better than the action we were planning. We got 558 people arrested, including me. That was another time that got beaten pretty brutally because I was completely non cooperative I went completely left. About 35 of us in the court were just completely non cooperative They had to drag us everywhere, including into court. And the judge went ballistic. And the, the cops were all upset. So when they dragged us out, they dragged me by my feet down the flight of stairs, which was really brutal because I had the choice of either destroying my back and destroying my head. I chose my back. Um, so we, um, so that was, so the point being that we had this amazing affinity group structure where we could move quickly. We could actually function in a way where we could move 150 people in 20 minutes off of a, a really well-planned action onto an even better thing, but spontaneously. And it worked. Afterwards, in the evaluation, everybody agreed that the, the earlier action would have been negative press, would have only lasted for the day. As it turned out, because one of the beautiful things is that 550 people were arrested. It took them four days to process everybody, partly because we weren't cooperating. We were messing up and kept changing wristbands and doing as many things we could. And because we were in jail for four days, every day there was a news story about the protesters in jail. And every day it was on the front page. And every day the people on the outside got to do demonstrations in support of the people arrested. It meant for four days instead of one. All these kind of benefits. So the major message there was by that point we had really learned consensus. So we both had really skilled facilitators. And the message there, and this is the hardest thing for people seems these days to learn, is that there's a difference between process and content. In any meeting, in any activity, in any group dynamic, you have process and you have content. And the mistake that young activists make, and I mean, by young I mean people new to activism, not their age. What the mistake they make is they think that the values they bring to the content, like inclusivity, egalitarian, uh, honest, uh, uh, economic justice, those values, they want to apply those same values to the process. And unfortunately, it does not work that way. I didn't make this up. This is my observation. I wish it wasn't this way. But my observation has been that if the process is rigid, absolute, clear, defined, you might say fascist, you know, totally rich, then that allows maximum safety, maximum creativity, maximum flexibility. The reason why we're able to change that decision I just told you in 20 minutes with 100 people and a big deal when we were about to be called out because it was about to happen was because there was a lot of safety. People trusted the process. They knew the process. They knew how it worked. They knew the facilitators were on task. They knew that we were right to let this woman have a voice. They got that 20 minutes was not too much to spend on this very, very, very important thing. And then when we started that 20 minutes, I would say 99% of people thought we'd end up in the same place we started. Nobody imagined we'd actually shift the entire action. And yet it came out of the creativity of the moment because it was the truth. And we were able to sustain it by having a really rigid structure.